Our teacher, Dr. J. Vernon McGee, once asked, Friend, what do you see in the cross of Christ? An innocent man dying unjustly? Do you see the cruelty of an execution and your heart goes out in pity? Welcome to Through the Bible. I'm Steve Schwetz, inviting you to hop aboard the Bible bus as we focus on the day on which all of history, all of eternity really, hangs like a hinge, the day the Lord Jesus Christ was crucified in order to save us. We're in Philippians 2. It's one of the most important and most glorious passages in the Bible. It describes what was going on behind the scenes that day and, in part, the reason Jesus died on the cross. But before we begin, Greg and I have got a quick update on how the Word of God is spreading in the largest country in Africa. And that's kind of a little quiz we can ask uh, ourselves and all the listeners. Of course, we have... We're, it's not we fair because notes. we know we know the answer to the question, but and the question would be: Let me rephrase it. What is the largest country in Africa by land mass? Yes, and uh, let's let's just give you a hint. It's in it's in northern Africa, and it begins with the letter A. So that would be Algeria. It's amazing how you know these. I things, know I'm Steve. sharp like I, that. I, it amazes me. <laughs> um, but you know, we we just want you, you to realize that the world is uh, is a big and an interesting place, and and God is letting us be in so many different places, like the largest land area country in Africa. Yeah, uh, forty six million people. Now yeah. Nigeria is the most populous country with two hundred and twenty four million, and you want to. Give us some perspective yeah, on the U.S. Yeah, in context of that, the U.S. has got 340 million. So Nigeria alone is not that far behind uh, exactly. the U.S. And I can imagine if you looked at the demographics of that, way younger median yes, age as absolutely. well. Absolutely. Yeah. They, I mean, Africa is oh, as a whole is something like 50 percent of the people are well under the age of 35, maybe even younger. So, yeah. uh, but this is a ministry we've talked about in the past. It's it's an area that's 99% Muslim, uh, Sunni Muslim in this case. Uh, and it's it's a difficult uh, area of the world. It's obviously very risky to become a Christian, but we, we've gotten some wonderful responses. Yeah, the other thing that I love to point out to people is this is not a Johnny-come-lately translation for us. Yes. We have been in Algeria in the Kabyle language for not 10, not yeah. 20, but 30, 30 years. years. Yep. I mean, a generation— Two, yes. uh, one and a half generations probably in that country have been born since the program was first translated and gone out. And I wish I could convey properly how significant that long-term presence is in, in really building a, a work of God. And, and so let's hear some of these yeah. great responses. Yeah, the first one says, I live in the far west of the country in a rather extremist region where the state religion is very dominant. We are very isolated and in a remote area, both physically and spiritually. It is not easy to be a believer in my family and in the middle of a very hostile society. That is why I am very happy to be in contact with you through messages and telephone. I thirst for communication and to be taught. Thank you for your friendship. And that calls out the importance of our follow-up team partners that yeah. are that are making phone calls, emails, and, and this next one also uh, points to that. Thank you for your calls and for praying for me as I underwent chemotherapy. Hmm. I know you ask many people to join you in prayer, and I am happy to report I am now cancer-free. Wow. Praise the Lord. The last analyses also came back negative, and I'm sure that God has touched me. Man, that is so encouraging. Greg, we don't have enough yeah. time to keep going, but why don't you pray for the ministry in Algeria as well as for the program as it goes out today in Philippians. Father, we can't even count the blessings that you shower on us, both through your son, Jesus Christ, in our personal lives and as part of this worldwide outreach. What an amazing thing. We just fall to our knees and say thank you that we can be part of bringing your word to precious believers and even unbelievers who will find you in a country like Algeria. Thank you for your faithfulness that we could be there for 30 years. Thank you that we know your word will never return void. And we, we go into today's study with that confidence. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's go now to Philippians 2 as we travel through the Bible with Dr. J. Vernon McGee. Now, friends, last time we left off here in the second chapter of the epistle to the Philippians. And this is such a wonderful chapter. We have the pattern for Christian living. And the Lord Jesus Christ is that pattern. Let this mind be in you. Not imitation, but the impartation 
of the mind of Christ. And after all, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, and then we have meekness, and we have this wonderful thing that characterized our Lord, which was humbleness, the mind of Christ. He was humble, and we saw that in the fact that he left heaven's glory, and he was God, worshiped as God by the heavenly host. Now he leaves all of that, and he comes to a Christ-rejecting world where they had him locked out, if you please, not even a place for him to be born. But God arranged a stable, and that was better than that public inn because all it would have been just one great room where each fellow put down his pallet, and that wouldn't have been a very nice place for Jesus to have been born before that leering crowd. And I think the dumb oxen were lots better than the dumb mob myself, and I still feel that stable became holy ground. All it was just a stable. And we find that he made this tremendous step downward. And he came down, he became a man, and he became a servant, took on the form of a servant. The prophets said that there would be a root out of Jesse. Isaiah, you'll recall, said that a root out of Jesse. And I often wondered as a young preacher, well, why didn't Isaiah say a root out of David? Well, I'll tell you why. The reason is that when Jesus was born, Mary, who was in the line of David, and Joseph, who was also in the Davidic line in another route, we find that these two were peasants. That's all they were, just humble peasants, unknown folk, living in that little miserable Gentile town called Nazareth. That's where Jesus was brought up. He took upon him the form of a servant, not the line of David. Oh, yes. But the interesting thing is, you see, David was anointed a king, but his father was not a king. He was a farmer in Bethlehem, raised sheep, you know. That's what he was. Nothing wrong in that other than he was just not a king. So a root now comes out of Jesse. The line is dropped back to the place of the peasant. And our Lord came as a servant. He took an humble place, you see. And he came all the way down. And we are told in verse 8, And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself. Now when it says he humbled himself, it means that someone else did not humble him. Now, many of us have been humble, I'm sure, by someone else doing it for us. Now, I won't give names or places, but I was speaking quite a few years ago at a certain summer conference grounds. And the custom in that day was for all the speakers in any given week would all sit on the platform every night for the evening service, regardless who was preaching. It was sort of a game like, I'll listen to you if you'll listen to me. And we would march on in a rather dignified and orderly manner. It was ritualistic. Well, in this auditorium, there had been a rain that afternoon. And believe me, it had poured down rain. And it had come in on the platform at certain places. And we had an Englishman on the program. He was a very gifted speaker, but very dignified. He couldn't get over the fact that I wore a sports shirt, even at night. That, to him, was the unpardonable sin. He wore a white shirt, collar and tie, in fact, a frock tail coat at night. And he was really dignified. And so he went in that night right ahead of me. And there was this water that had come from the rain was there on the platform. Made it rather slippery. He went in in a very dignified way and he hit that slick place there. His feet went out from under him and he sat down with, oh, quite a bump. 
And you couldn't help but laugh. The man had broken his neck. I guess we would all laughed at him. And the audience roared. He got up. I've never seen anyone as humiliated as he was. In fact, I was laughing, so I had to leave the platform. I went to the back, and he came back because he was so humiliated. I've never seen a man humbled as that man. And the next night when we started in, I said to him, you know, it'd be nice if we could have a repeat performance of what you did last night. And he turned on me. He says, wasn't that humiliating? Well, it certainly was. But you see, he didn't humble himself. He was humiliated. Now, many of us have been humiliated, but our Lord humbled himself. And that's something altogether different, you see. Then we are told here, became obedient unto death. Now, death is a very humiliating sort of thing. Actually, it's not natural. I hear people say sometimes at a funeral, my, doesn't he look natural? And I have to bite my lip because it's generally said by some well-meaning friend who wants to comfort the loved ones. I don't know why that should comfort them that uncle so-and-so, our grandfather, looks natural in death. To tell the truth, I have to bite my lip to keep from saying, no, they don't look natural. Death is not natural. God didn't create man to die Man dies because of sin, because of his transgression. And death came by the transgression of one man, and that one man was Adam. And death is humiliating. Now, when the Lord Jesus came to this earth, he's a little different than the rest of us. I don't know about you, but I suspect that you're like I am. I came to live, not to die. I honestly don't want to die. I want to live. And I've asked the Lord to let me live and finish this five-year program. When I first discovered, the doctor first discovered I had cancer, I was in the midst of a a two-and-a-half-year program. And I asked everybody to pray that I finish the two-and-a-half-year program. And at that time, it didn't look like I would. Well, the Lord let me finish it. And I immediately came up with a five-year program. And a friend of mine up in the San Francisco Bay Area that kids me a great deal, he said to me, he said, I know what you're going to do. The minute you finish that five-year program, if the Lord lets you finish it, you're going to come up with a 10-year program. You want to know something? I'd like to. I'm not going to. We'll have the five-year program again. But the interesting thing is that, very candidly, (laughs) I don't want to die. When I hear people say, oh, they want to die and Go and be with the Lord. Well, that's far better, but Paul says that's the ultimate. But he says to remain here is far better. (laughs) I like that. I feel that there's a work to be done and that there's something for us to do today as we remain here on this earth. And I want to stay, but death is something. I don't want to die. Now, the Lord Jesus came to this earth to die. He didn't have to die. But he came and gave himself willingly. He became obedient unto death. He didn't have to. I have to die. Don't want to. He didn't have to die, but he wanted to. Why? In order that he might save me and save you and you and all of you, if you trust him, became obedient unto death. And then the seventh and last thing, the death of the cross. Now, that's the same as we would say the gas chamber, the hangman's noose, or the electric chair, whatever it might be, the form of death. And I don't want to intrude something else here, but the Word of God does teach capital punishment. And this book has been probably the greatest civilizing instrument the world has ever had. And when anyone makes the statement that capital punishment is uncivilized, They apparently do not know what is the very foundation of civilization. That happened to be the Word of God. And my friend, if we don't put capital punishment back in, we're going to find out that many of us won't dare go out of our homes of an evening. It won't be safe anymore to walk the streets maybe in broad daylight. And that's true in some places 
may I say to you, we're not as civilized as we think we are. Now, God didn't give capital punishment because it's uncivilized. He gave capital punishment because man is a sinner, and man is totally depraved. That's his condition, and doesn't make any difference who he is. And the only deliverance from a moral breakdown is revival. Unless revival comes, of course, we're apparently gone. Now, the Lord Jesus came down and took the death of the cross, the lowest thing that he could take. He came from the highest glory to the lowest place of humiliation. And why did he do it? Let's go back to our word, others, others. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. He left all of the glory of heaven, and he came down to this earth, became a man for others, for you and you and for me. Thank God for that. Now, that's the mind of Christ. Now the mind of God is to glorify Christ. Beginning at verse 9, we have seven steps upward. Now we've had seven steps downward. We are going to have seven steps upward. Now will you notice the mind of God, therefore, is the exaltation of Christ. And these are the seven steps. Beginning here with verse 9, wherefore God also hath highly exalted him. That is the supreme purpose of God the Father in this universe, that Jesus Christ be glorified in the universe that he created, and that he be glorified on the earth where man dwells, where man rebelled against God. And the thing that makes this little earth significant and important happens to be the death of Christ, nothing else. When I hear an astronomer say, we are a little speck in space, and if this little universe we lived on was blotted out, wouldn't make any difference. It just wouldn't make any difference. And it wouldn't. It's absolutely true. Someone has said that though on this universe, that man is a disease on the epidermis of a minor planet. That's what we are. (laughs) But my friend, the thing that has lent dignity to man and has caused him to look up into the heavens and sing the doxology is the fact that Jesus Christ came to this earth and died on the cross for us. Wherefore, God also hath highly exalted him. Now the second step, and given him a name which is above every name. And next time you take his name in vain, think of that. God intends that name that you drag in the mud, that you use in vain. Pilot that stepped off of one of these planes where the bomb exploded. Almost a miracle that he was able to bring that plane down. He said he just stood over at the side and said, Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ. Now, I don't know how he said it. He could have said it as profanity. God have mercy on him if he did it that way. Or he could have made that a prayer. And that name of Jesus Christ is to be exalted above every name. No, I don't care. You can take the great men of the world. You can take the angels of glory. There's going to be a name above every name, and that's the name of Jesus. Now, will you notice the third thing that is said here, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow. And that includes everything. That's the third, the fourth of things in heaven, and fifth, things in earth, and sixth, things under the earth. Now, there have been some that have used this clause here to mean that all will be reconciled to God someday, even hell. But may I say to you, that's not the teaching of the Word of God. Every place will have to recognize who Jesus Christ is. Even in hell, they're going to have to recognize that. And by the way, I think that'll contribute partly to their punishment. 
Imagine those that have taken his name in vain, hated him, disowned him, actually spit upon him down here, and having to acknowledge his lordship. But they're not reconciled to God at all, because you find in the epistle to the Colossians that he made peace through the blood of his cross to reconcile all things unto himself. All things, then, that means unto the earth. Oh, no. By him I say whether they be things in earth or things in heaven, but not under the earth. No, hell is not reconciled to him, but hell will have to recognize who he is. God has determined that. Even the Christ rejectors will have to stand before him someday and recognize who he is. That is the important and the tremendous thing. Now will you notice here, every knee shall bow therefore to him. Then we're told in verse 11 here, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Now that doesn't mean they confess him as Savior. You confess him as Savior here, but you will have to confess him as Lord there. That's quite interesting. Even in hell, they have to recognize the lordship of Jesus. And may I say to you, and I say it very carefully, we ought to be very careful about calling him our Lord if he's not our Lord. You remember he made this statement that there are going to be many in that day that are going to say, Lord, Lord. (laughs) They call him Lord. And they did actually miracles in his name. He's going to say, I didn't even know you. (laughs) My friend, you better know him as your Savior before you start running around and talking about the fact that he's your Lord. Make sure he's your Savior. And then if he's your Savior, then you can bow to him and you can become obedient unto him. I don't even like to hear them sing what a friend we have in Jesus. We sure have a friend in him, all right. But he says, you are my friends if you do whatsoever I command you. Are you doing what he commands you? Then don't call him your friend. He says, you're my friends if you do what I command you. Oh, my friend today, even in hell, they're going to have to bow and acknowledge who he is. But they don't claim him as their savior. They spurned him and rejected him down here. We'll pick up right there next time. So until then, may God richly bless you, my beloved. Join me this weekend for our Sunday sermon, The Man Who Lost His Religion, from Philippians 3. You can download our app or listen online at ttb.org, or to be in touch, just call 1-800-65-BIBLE. Now here's Dr. McGee with one of his favorite poems about Jesus called Consider Him. As you leave the bus today, friends, having gone through with us this section in which the Lord Jesus Christ is presented to us, in all the glory of his person, and the one that came down to this earth, even to the place of the death of the cross, now God has exalted him. And he's the one that we need to come to. And here is a thought that I'd like for you to take with you today. The title of it is, Consider Him. When the storm is raging high, When the tempest rends the sky, when my eyes with tears are dim, then my soul consider him. When my plans are in the dust, when my dearest hopes are crushed, when is past each foolish whim, then my soul consider him. When with dearest friends I part, when deep sorrow fills my heart, When pain racks each weary limb, then, my soul, consider him. When I track my weary way, when fresh trials come each day, when my faith and hope are dim, then, my soul, consider him. 
Clouds are sunshine, dark or bright, evening shades or morning light. When my cup flows o'er the brim, then my soul consider him. Jesus came home, all to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain, he washed it white as snow. Well, ride the Bible bus for five years and you'll be amazed what God teaches you from his word about what it means to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. It's a blessing that keeps on going. That's what we believe at Through the Bible.